My name is Nathan Greeley. I teach philosophy at Indiana Wesleyan University, and I teach apologetics at American Lutheran Theological Seminary. And I also do various things for Justin Sinner. I've published a couple books with them, or I published one and I have one coming out soon. And I also am the managing editor for the conservative reformer. So that's basically who I am, what my interests are. They mostly revolve around philosophy and theology, apologetics, the relationship between faith and reason. And that's a lot of what I'll be talking about tonight. My assumption going into tonight's seminar was that most people attending probably would not have a great amount of familiarity with this text. And for that reason, I'm going to quote Origen quite a bit because I want to give him a chance to speak for himself. And I want to show you or, or let you see how he expresses himself and the style that he uses uh, in his writings. So I've got a lot of stuff to, to talk about. Uh, Contra Kelsum is a, a pretty interesting work, and there's a lot of different aspects to it. So we've got a lot of things to talk about tonight. So I'm going to jump into it, and at, we'll save any questions that anybody has until the end, any questions or comments. The first thing I'm going to start off with is talking a little bit about who Origin is. Most people, or I shouldn't say most, but most Christians who have paid any attention to church history have probably heard of Origen, but um, a lot of people I don't think have, have studied him in depth, and I think part of that is because he has a pretty checkered reputation. So we'll talk more about that uh, as we go on tonight. So the first thing I want to get into is his life and, and his work, giving you some background. So most of what we know about Origen's life, it comes from the ecclesiastical history of Eusebius of Caesarea, which was written in the early fourth century. Eusebius was the student of one of Origen's followers, a man named Pamphilus, and therefore his account of Origen's life is regarded by most scholars as generally credible and reliable. Origen was born in Alexandria, Egypt, in about 185. He was the first famous Christian intellectual to be born to Christian parents. Prior to that, all of the, the famous intellectuals were converts. His father's name was Leonides. Leonides was a teacher in Alexandria who encouraged Origen to study the liberal arts and the Bible. This Origen did with great diligence, memorizing a substantial amount of scripture as a youth. At this time, sons often came to have the same occupations or positions as their fathers, and it would have been natural for Origen himself to become a teacher. And that is, in fact, what happened. Leonides was martyred during the reign of Septimius Severus when Origen was about 17. Origen wanted to also be a martyr, but his mother prevented this. She supposedly did this by hiding his clothing so that he would have to leave the house naked if he wanted to turn himself into the Roman authorities. Origen was too bashful to do this, so he stayed home and his life was saved. A short time later, Origen began his teaching career. Seeing his great talents, the Bishop of Alexandria, who at that time his name was Demetrius, appointed Origen to teach in the Alexandrian Church's catechetical school, which had formerly been overseen by Clement of Alexandria. Origen was not ordained at this time, however, so he was teaching as a lay theologian. During these early years, Origen spent time at several schools in, Origen, uh, in Alexandria to expand his knowledge. Most scholars believe he studied with a Platonist philosopher named Ammonius Saccus, who was also a teacher of Plotinus, the founder of Neoplatonism. In any case, Origen became very knowledgeable about the different schools of Greek philosophy, Platonism, 
um, Aristotelianism, Epicureanism, Stoicism, so forth. An important figure in Origen's adult life in Alexandria was a man named Ambrose. Obviously not St. Ambrose, this is somebody that lived uh, before him. Ambrose was a former Gnostic who had left Gnosticism for Catholic Christianity due to Origen's influence. Ambrose was very wealthy, and he was able to fill the role of a patron to Origen and fund his scholarship. He paid for books, for writing materials, for a house for Origen to pursue his studies, and for scribes to take dictation from Origen and to produce copies of his works. So he basically funded an entire publishing house for Origen. Under Ambrose's patronage, Origen was able to achieve an unprecedented level of literary activity and production. And it's safe to assume that his output would have been severely impeded or curtailed if he had not been able to benefit from Ambrose's great generosity. As Origen's writings spread throughout the empire, his fame as a teacher did likewise. He began to receive invitations to visit Christians in other parts of the empire and to teach them or to give them advice. As a result of this, he began to travel outside of Egypt. He visited Italy, Palestine, and Arabia. Eventually, he also visited Greece. He formed strong relationships with Christians in Palestine, including the bishops of Jerusalem and Caesarea. For reasons that are unclear, Origen also fell out of favor with his own bishop in Alexandria, Demetrius. It may have been the case that Demetrius felt threatened by Origen's growing fame and authority as a scholar. Origen repeatedly asked Demetrius to be ordained, but Demetrius refused to allow this. Things became more intense when the bishops of Palestine allowed Origen to preach in their churches. When Demetrius heard that Origen had been allowed to do this, he was incensed, and he demanded that Origen return at once to Alexandria. He openly criticized the Palestinian bishops for allowing a layman to preach. The Palestinian bishops, in turn, censured Demetrius for jealousy unbecoming of a bishop. On a subsequent visit to Palestine, which occurred in 231, Origen asked the bishop of Caesarea to ordain him, and the bishop complied with his wish. This infuriated Demetrius, and he severely attacked Origen for his insubordination. Origen, as a result, decided not to return to Alexandria. He stayed in Caesarea. The bishops in Palestine appointed him the chief theologian of Caesarea, and Origen started a new school there in which he taught philosophy and theology. At this point, his fame reached its peak, and during the remaining two decades of his life, he was known throughout the Roman Empire as the foremost Christian intellectual. Many Christians looked to him as a defender of orthodoxy, and they, were, they sought his help in identifying and combating heresies. During these years, Origen taught several men who would go on to have distinguished careers in the church. The pagan philosopher Porphyry, who was a student of Plotinus and a strong critic of Christianity, traveled to Caesarea to hear Origen lecture. The fact that a pagan philosopher opposed to Christianity would do this attests to the great reputation that Origen had as a man of tremendous learning. According to Porphyry, Origen and Plotinus met on at least one occasion. In around 249, a plague broke out that spread throughout the Roman Empire. A year later, the reigning emperor, Decius, placed, uh, placed the blame for the plague on Christians and claimed that their refusal to honor him as a god had caused the outbreak. He ordered that they be subjected to punishment. Origen was among those captured and tortured. His imprisonment lasted for about two years, and during this time, he experienced extreme suffering. The Roman governor of Caesarea 
ordered that Origen must not be allowed to die and escape from his torments unless he publicly renounced his faith first. Origen did not renounce his faith, however, and after Decius's death, he was released from prison. However, the impact of his imprisonment on his health was severe, and he never fully recovered from the ordeal. He died soon after his release at the age of 69. So that's his biography in a nutshell. The next thing that I want to comment on is his work, his writings. So Origen was an extremely prolific writer. Ancient sources claim that he wrote over a thousand works. Uh, Eusebius claims that he wrote 2,000. Uh, whether or not he actually did, of course, is, is highly debatable and questionable, but it's clear that he was a very prolific individual in any case. Unfortunately for scholars and historians, very little of this massive output has survived intact down to the present day. A few works are extant in their entirety, but many are only found in fragments. The majority of them have disappeared. Um, some of what we have now exists only in Latin translations, Origen's original Greek texts having been lost. One estimate is that about one third of his work survives in some form. The loss of so much of his writing is primarily due to the fact that in the sixth century, the emperor Justinian ordered his works to be destroyed, and he was posthumously condemned by bishops meeting at the Fifth Ecumenical Council in Constantinople. We'll have to talk about why uh, shortly. This condemnation, it damaged his reputation and that of his writings, and it made copies of his work very scarce, especially in the original Greek. At this time, any works that were not highly esteemed by Christians of course, were generally not copied frequently enough to survive, and Origen's works now were in that category. Origen wrote detailed exegetical commentaries on several books of the Bible. In these works, he displayed tremendous erudition and dialectical skill. Origen had a remarkable ability to remember where specific terms are found throughout the scriptures, and would analyze and compare many different passages to settle various questions. His commentaries were highly valued by many Christians in antiquity, as they were unprecedented and unrivaled in terms of how carefully and deeply they engaged with the biblical text. Some might say that they found depths that were not even really there. Today we possess remains from his commentaries on Genesis, Song of Songs, Ezekiel, Hosea, Matthew, John, and Romans. The commentary on Song of Songs was regarded as particularly masterful, and Origen was the first Christian exegete to assert of this book that the bridegroom represents Christ and the bride represents Christians or the church. We also have over 200 homilies he delivered on parts of the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, 1 Samuel, Psalms, Song of Songs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Luke. Besides these writings that are, of course, directly focused on the Bible, there survives a 4th century Latin translation of his work on first principles. This book is often seen as the first attempt to provide a summary of Christian doctrine although it is less systematic and comprehensive than what would uh, one would find in a modern or even in a medieval summary. Much of the work in Greek has been lost, however. The only complete version that we have of On First Principles is a Latin translation. The quality of this translation is problematic, however, as it seems clear that the translator, whose name was Rufinus, changed parts of the work to bring it into line with 4th century post-Nicene orthodoxy. So he wanted to clean Origen up, uh, in other words. 
The parts of the work that are also extant in the original Greek show us that Rufinus generally preserved Origen's meaning, but his translation is much closer to a paraphrase than to a word-for-word -word rendering. Thus, although Rufinus's translation of On First Principles gives us a valuable picture of Origen's thought, and most of it is doubtless based on Origen's Greek text, most scholars believe it is difficult to know for certain if any specific wording goes back to Origen himself. A work that survives in its entirety in the original Greek is Contra Celsum, which is Origen's lengthy and diffuse response to a second century pagan critic of Christianity named Celsus. Probably because it was primarily a defense of Christianity and not intended to be an exposition of Origen's own theology, this work continued to be copied by Greek-speaking Christians, um, but probably not that often. We have it today thanks to the preservation of one 13th century manuscript, Vaticanus Graecus 386. The work was first printed in Latin in 1481. As this is the main topic of our discussion tonight, much more is going to have to be said about it in what follows. Another major work of origins was his Hexapla, which was a massive parallel Bible that he edited and put together. This Bible contained the original Hebrew text of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, three other Greek translations of the whole Bible, and a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew text, the Hebrew text written in Greek letters. In the Psalms, the number of Greek translations numbered at least eight. So this was a massive work, and it was a massive undertaking. It no doubt filled thousands of pages, and because of that, it was never reproduced outside of uh, various fragments that, that were copied or preserved. Besides these, Origen also wrote a few other notable works. One is his Exhortation to Martyrdom, which is a book encouraging persecuted Christians to remain steadfast in their faith. And another is On Prayer, which contains a discussion of the nature of prayer and an exposition of the Lord's Prayer. So that gives you an idea of his output. Like I said, the, the majority of it has been lost, sadly. Um, at least for the sake of scholars, it's unfortunate. Next thing I want to talk about are his defenders and detractors, or his, his fans and his critics. He has a lot of both um, due to various, various factors. So Origen has always had a very mixed reception in the church. In the 6th century, Cassiodorus provided a reason for this when he said of Origen that, quote, where he was good, no one was better, but where he was bad, no one was worse, end quote. The truth is that Origen was probably never the best or the worst, but his thought was certainly marked by good and bad aspects, as we'll talk much more about uh, later this evening. And this led to diverse views about the overall value of his work. In the early church, he was thought highly of by Gregory Thaumaturgus, Eusebius of Caesarea, Athanasius, Didymus the Blind, and the Cappadocian Fathers, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory Nanzianzen, and Basil of Caesarea. Aspects of his teaching were staunchly opposed, however, by Methodius of Olympus and Epiphanius of Salamis. Jerome initially approved of Origen's theology and made extensive use of Origen's commentaries in his own writings, but later he became a harsh critic who tried to distance himself as much as possible from Origen. And this appears to have been because he realized that the perception of Origen was changing and that Origen was coming to be regarded as an unsound theologian by many other people of his time, the late uh, fourth century. Augustine's view of Origen was both ambiguous and ambivalent. He respected Origen's learning and piety, 
and was evidently influenced by some of his ideas. But he also thought that Origen was nearly Pelagian in his understanding of free will and salvation. And he did not appreciate his ideas about post-mortem punishments being temporary and rehabilitative. During the Reformation and the Renaissance, Luther and Melanchthon expressed strong reservations. Which you could say that they, they really did not like Origen's exegetical methods. Origen was convinced, excuse me, Luther was convinced that Origen had failed to properly understand the gospel. He was also very critical of Origen's extensive use of allegory. Uh, Origen received approbation, however, from several humanists who were attracted to his erudition and his love of, of Greek philosophy, including Erasmus, Marsilio Ficino, and Giovanni Pico della Mirandola. In the 20th century, French scholar Eugene de Fay echoed a long line of previous critics in claiming that Origen was fundamentally a philosopher and only gave the appearance of being a biblical theologian. According to DeFay, Origen himself was not fully aware of this influence. He was unaware that his philosophical beliefs were driving his biblical interpretation. In contrast to this, several Roman Catholic theologians in the 20th century held that Origen was always first and foremost a student and teacher of the Bible, and that his studies in philosophy were peripheral to his main concerns. These defenders of origin included Henri de Lubac, Hans Urs von Balthasar, Jean Donnelly, and Henri Cruzel. Today, the majority of scholars writing on origin seem to be intent on providing a very charitable view of his work and interests. Uh, there's very few people writing on Origen who are not, who are not uh, sympathetic to him in some way, it seems. Many seem to want to characterize him as a misunderstood genius who was always fully orthodox in his intentions, if not in his actual teachings. Uh, this is, generally speaking, a fruitful way to understand Origen, because we want to be as charitable as we can with respect to any uh, historical figure. But certain aspects of the traditional criticisms of his thought are not without justification, in my view. De Fay is not wholly wrong when he sees philosophy as having a magisterial role in Origen's thought. For it seems clear to me that wherever Origen misconstrues the meaning of scripture, it is the result of such an improper dependence on philosophy. So the next thing I want to talk about is where exactly he goes wrong, in my opinion. And uh, there's no doubt plenty of people that would, would disagree with how I'm going to characterize things here. But this is what I see as, as the fundamental problems with, with his teaching. So we now come to the issue of what all the controversy surrounding origin is about. It would be amiss to not mention this aspect of his legacy at all. But since it's not the primary focus of the seminar, I am going to try to address it quickly. The first thing we need to acknowledge is that there is much dispute about what Origen really taught. He has been misrepresented by both friends and foes, and virtually every interpretation of his work is contested by someone. Part of the problem here is that much of his work has been lost, as, has been, as I have mentioned. Another issue is that the translations by Rufinus are rather inaccurate. So um, a significant portion of what we do have, we can't really rely on it or trust it 100%. Origen himself seems to have often proposed ideas for consideration or deliberation without expressing a commitment to them. So he would treat things in a hypothetical way without necessarily uh, wanting to, to state them as, as dogma or as, as things that he was uh, committed to. This opened up numerous ways in which he could be misunderstood. Though it would be unwarranted, I think, uh, to believe that everything Origen has been accused of 
actually stems from his thought and writings or can be found therein. It is also true that um, there were probably traces in what he taught and wrote of most of the doctrines that have been imputed to him. A few accusations occur repeatedly in discussions of origin and are worth noting. Although there are scholars who claim that Origen did not espouse some of these views that I'm going to mention in a moment, it seems probable that he thought that they were at least acceptable positions that were worthy of consideration. In other words, they, they were on the table. They were live options for him. One is that Origen affirms the pre-existence of souls. These souls were all created in a good and equal state and enjoyed perfect communion with God. But then, by their own free choice, they turned away from God, and consequently, they were imprisoned in material bodies as a punishment. Origen holds that some of them, in turning away, sinned more egregiously than others. The least at fault of those who fell became heavenly bodies. Those incurring more guilt became humans. Those even more at fault were made irrational creatures and the worst of all became demons. He seems to think with other people of ancient times that the stars were intelligent beings and that demons have shadowy bodies of some kind. Thus, all of the levels of created being in the material cosmos for him are the result of a primeval fall of purely spiritual creatures. All apparent inequalities are the result of sins which preceded the creation of the cosmos. So in other words, to sum up, people, uh, all of these souls that pre-existed fell away from God, some of them in a, in a more egregious way than others, and because of that, they were given a particular location in this hierarchy that we find in the material cosmos. Among humans, those who were more culpable in turning away from God were born into less desirable situations while those who were less at fault were born into more desirable conditions. So the reason why some people are born into uh, rich families or into you know, a high status is because they didn't sin as badly as people who are born into uh, low status positions or people that have uh, disabilities and so forth. A second teaching worth mentioning is that Origen affirms that punishments after death are only temporary and that even demons have some hope of eventually being reconciled to God. Origen seems to think that the end of things has to be like the beginning of things. Eschatology must be an echo of protology. Since all beings were united to God at the initial creation, all beings ought to be united to God at the culmination or the end of creation. So he has this, everything is... um. There, there's a symmetry there that he sees between the beginning and the end. He thinks the end has to be like the beginning. A third issue is that Origen holds that some narratives in the Old Testament are not historical. He believes they did not actually happen, but contain material that is intended to be interpreted allegorically. This includes the story of the fall of Adam and Eve, which, as we have seen, appears to have happened before the existence of the material world, in his view. Um, he talks about the garments that God makes for Adam and Eve as actually uh, representing the bodies that he gives their souls after they have fallen. All of these teachings can be traced back to a few problematic assumptions that Origen makes, in my opinion. One is that he believes that he can use his notion of what is fitting for God as a criterion for what can count as an acceptable interpretation of scripture. His notion of what is fitting is not primarily derived from scripture, it's not for the most part, but from his natural reason. This assumption entails that he often fails to allow scripture to correct his assumptions. As DeFay indicated, he instead continually allows reason to have a magisterial role in his theological work and he forces the biblical message to conform to his ideas about what God could, would, and should do. 
if one seeks a primary reason for why his exegesis goes astray at times, this is it. Origen also assumes that justice requires that every individual receive whatever he merits, whether for bad or for good. Since God is perfectly just, he always responds to people on the basis of their merits. And because of this assumption, Origen misunderstands the gospel and the full significance of the cross. He assumes that Christ is primarily a lawgiver, and the cross was a way of breaking the power of Satan, which prevents people from keeping the law. He also assumes that any difference in circumstances must be a consequence of either merit or demerit. And because of this, he puts forward his doctrine of preexistence, which I've just uh, discussed. These ideas entail a confusion of law and gospel that is evident throughout Origen's writings. Of course, he is not alone in this. In the early church, this is a very common problem. Origen's conception of merit is moreover related to his assumption that ought implies can, and therefore that since people ought to do good, this must mean that people have an inherent freedom to choose the good. He never tires of reminding his reader how strongly he affirms the freedom of the will. This assumption that people have freedom even in spiritual matters naturally entails a diminishment of the power of sin and its effects and consequences. Origen admits that people have a tendency to sin, and as a matter of fact, everybody has actually sinned, but he also thinks that even pagans have the ability to avoid sinning. He believes that there are Christians who have never sinned since their conversion, although he grants that this is rather uncommon. Another assumption that Origen makes is that a good or just punishment should not be retributive, but only remedial or rehabilitative. Because of this view, he assumes that all divine punishments, even post-mortem punishments, are ultimately intended to transform and purify sinners into good and godly creatures who are capable of communion with God. It is because of this assumption that he teaches that post-mortem Repentance is possible. Yet another problematic assumption Origen makes is that he believes there are two types of Christians, the simple and the advanced, and that the literal meaning of scripture is primarily intended for the former, but not for the latter. For the advanced Christian, the Bible is a book of wisdom hidden in allegories. This assumption supports the view that allegorical interpretations are superior to and more authoritative than the literal sense of scripture. It also means that Origen is free to allegorize whenever he finds a text that has a literal sense that he finds objectionable to his sense of what is fitting for God, what is appropriate. So most of the ideas for which Origen has, been, has received strong criticism stem from these assumptions and beliefs. And they are all things that obviously I think we need to do our best to avoid. Uh, obviously in Lutheranism, none of these things is really uh, something that's prevalent. Interestingly, in my opinion, they all are related in some way to his efforts to provide an answer to the problem of evil. So he wants to show that there is absolutely no evil, no cruelty, no injustice that can be attributed to God. And I believe his thoughts on free will, the pre-existence of souls, punishment, universalism, and allegorical interpretation, they those all serve in some way or other to vindicate his uh, position on this matter. If he had been less interested in finding a comprehensive solution to the problem of evil, or if he had discovered a different solution more in keeping with the literal sense of scripture, then I think his thought might have been less marked by these various problems. So I think ultimately he is trying to provide a solution to the problem of evil. And he believes that these various moves that we've just talked about need to be made in order to ensure that God cannot be charged with any kind of injustice or evil whatsoever. Even though there is much to criticize in origin, and obviously the things that we've just 
talked about are, are very significant. There are also many positive things that we can say about his life and his work. Origen seems to have been a man of earnest faith and piety, and he intended to be an opponent of heresy. No one doubts that he devoted himself to studying the Bible with a zeal that few people have probably ever matched. In many respects, he was the first serious biblical scholar in the history of Christianity. Although his interpretations are sometimes off, he always intends to find what God is saying in a given passage. Importantly, he also understood that pagan learning can be of value to the church as it seeks to expound and defend its teaching. He saw that theology in any highly developed form is impossible without the liberal arts. Moreover, he insisted on the eternal generation of the sun, and thus he provided some help to the later formulation of Nicene Orthodoxy. He also was instrumental in solidifying the church's affirmation of the doctrine of divine simplicity. In On First Principles, as we've talked about, he was the first person to attempt to provide a substantial summary of Christian teaching, and he therefore can be credited with creating the genre of dogmatics or systematic theology. And last but not least, he also provided the most thorough apology for Christianity that had been written up until his time, one which, in my estimation, still repays study. And, of course, it is to this that we are going to uh, turn now and focus on for the rest of our discussion here.